So I set it on the ground and I couldn't stop it. It just kept going and sliding. Well, you were so busy that we didn't have time to think, and it's a good thing you didn't, you know. The reason everybody wants to hear my story is because I was 13th. And the airborne run across the road and wanted to know what I had in the glider, and a couple of them even kissed the glider. They were so glad to see it. Lots of snow and very cold. We could see uh, some of the tow ships going down, and I saw some of the gliders blow up. I was under crossfire all the way down. The Battle of the Bulge had one unique feature that is neither well remembered or well known, the use of combat gliders. This video program reviews that glider mission. Gerard M. Devlin in his book Silent Wings reports, and I quote, the vital contribution made by the American glider pilots toward the winning of the Battle of the Bulge is generally unknown to military history buffs and even to some professional military historians. Indeed, all but a very few of the combat infantry veterans of the Bulge interviewed by this author were unaware that 61 gliders had landed at Bastogne during the height of the battle. German meteorologists forecast bad weather enshrouded by fog for Western Europe for the middle of December of 1944. Early on December 16th, three German armies began a massive assault in the Ardennes forest area of Luxembourg and Belgium. Since 1870, the German general staff had a military principle and preference for envelopment over frontal assaults against stubborn resistance. This is exactly what happened when the 101st Airborne Division fought so gallantly and well. They were surrounded and bypassed. But Bastogne was an important highway hub and badly needed to support the advancement of the German army toward the Meuse River and then to the major objective, Antwerp. It was most important that the Allies hold Bastogne and deny its highway system and its use to the Germans. Basically and historically, German armies had come through these same areas in 1914 and 1940, and the countries fell within a few days. There seemed every reason to believe they would fall in the same way in December of 1944. These men of the Airborne were men of exceptionally tough fiber and held the German army at bay long enough to make the difference. We were stationed just outside of Paris at Reims, France to reorganize and re-equip and get in replacements and get ready to jump again when needed. Uh, when the Germans finally mustered enough power in one spot, they picked that Audubon coming through Bastogne to get to uh, Antwerp where all the resupplies for France was coming in. When they broke through clean, it was just a matter of time. So they brought us up, which was an infantry, parachute infantry division, to stop them. And we got in Bastogne and outside the city limits on the other side when we hit the first German Sigma. Well, we stopped them. And they tried to go around, and their Tiger Royal tanks were too heavy for the secondary roads, and they couldn't move uh, very effectively. And they tried to take us and couldn't. And we held off eight German divisions. Later, Field Marshal Hermann Goering said that Bastogne was the key to the entire attack. Hitler himself personally ordered General Model to forget about Bastogne once the 101st occupied it. We had a few units that were, uh, that the Germans had uh, routed in the breakthrough that fell back on us. Uh, most of them were tra tank destroyers and, uh, and possibly that was the difference of us stopping some tank attacks that we couldn't then have pack houses was the heaviest artillery piece that we had. And it wouldn't, it just knocked the dust off a of Tiger Royal. But uh, those tank destroyers that were cut off with us from the 7th Armored Division, they were put in reserve and wherever the hot spot was, that's where they'd show up. 
and Christmas Day was a long day. Seven tanks got through during the night. Well, we'd put the mines down in the snow, and in daytime we'd take them out because the Germans would shoot artillery down the road trying to explode those mines. And we'd put them in the ditch beside. Well, this lead German tank came down and he seen those imprints in the snow and thought they were mines and went to the ditch and that's where the mines were. <laughs> well, we had a, a pretty good round. Uh, he, uh, every time we'd shoot the bazooka at him, it'd bounce off. And uh, finally I told the, one of the bazooka men to crawl down in the snow behind him and try to get in the rear of him. And he did, and knocked him out. He went through the radiator, and it went inside. And uh, that had the road blocked, and the other tanks couldn't get through. Well, those tank destroyers that had been cut off was right near regiment, regimental headquarters, and they got over behind the hill, and they would shoot, come up and take a shot, then slide back behind the hill, then another one come up in a different area and take a shot. And they knocked out the front and the rear tank and sacked them up. And they went to work till they got all, all up. During the bitter fighting for Bastogne, the exceptional use by the 101st Airborne Division of its artillery was one of the major reasons their perimeter remained intact the 10 days that will never be forgotten in American history. On December 22nd, two German officers passed through Allied lines to demand surrender. Their answer was the famous nuts. The arrogant German officers, a captain and a major, were confused upon receiving the answer. I do not understand nuts, said the captain who translated for the major. If you don't understand what nuts means, in plain English, it is the same as go to hell. Early on December 19th, the entire medical company, including the field hospital of the 101st Airborne Division while still en route, were captured. Heavy fighting and superhuman resistance was responsible for large amounts of wounded with only local doctors poorly equipped to handle them. General McAuliffe sent a radio message Christmas Day that he urgently needed emergency glider delivery of surgeons, artillery shells, and gasoline. Some badly needed supplies could be and were dropped from C-47s, but doctors, large artillery shells, and gasoline had to come in by glider. General McAuliffe stated that of all the things his division desperately needed, the combat surgeons should be given first priority. So on December 26th, Flight Officer Charlton W. Corwin Jr. and his co-pilot, Flight Officer Benjamin F. Constantino of the 96th Troop Carrier Squadron of the 440th Troop Carrier Group took off from a fighter base at Aitan with two combat surgical teams plus their equipment and supplies. But the glider had been used in the Holland mission and all of the seat belts were missing. Corwin told the medics to hold on to the metal tubing of which the glider was constructed. The supplies were piled in the middle of the floor and not tied down. None of the medical people on board had ever been in a glider before. Corwin was busy looking for the landmarks that he had been briefed on, plus yellow smoke that was to be on the LZ. Constantino, the co-pilot, said he saw the panels marking the LZ, and Corwin cut off and landed in a snow-covered field close to a tree line. All were safe, but the panels they had seen was a perimeter limit panel for Allied fighter aircraft, and the LZ that they were supposed to land on later proved to be zeroed in by German mortar squads and the medical teams that had been so desperately needed may not have been as lucky. Uh, I was given the order to load gasoline and another one of the other squadron engineering was out there helping load when uh, Corky Corwin and uh, Constantine took off. And, uh, we didn't even know what was in there. That's what they had. All we saw them bring staff car out and uh, a weapon carrier out, and Corky waved at us. And the next thing I knew, that that glider was gone. And then we found out that they were going into Bastogne taking medical supplies. We loaded Jerry cans of gasoline. I'm trying to think of how many we had on each side. 
uh, I think they went back either 12 or 14 cans back, doubled cans back, two tiers. No. We just come in from loading the gliders. We didn't know what the mission was. So we just come in from loading gliders and sat down to eat. And just as I was sitting at the table, a guy tapped me on the shoulder and said, you're wanted briefing right now. When I looked up at him, I seen who he was. And I said, yeah, when I finish my meal. And he says, now. So I went over <laughs> headquarters and we sat for the briefing. Nothing was said was what was going on when we were loading the gasoline, who it was for. But then afterwards we found out. We were given five minutes to get our equipment, get on the truck, taken out to Breezy. Gliders were lined up on the runway. We took off, I think it was around four. I know it was just getting darn good and dark up to Bastogne when we landed. Oh, they supposed to had smudge pots for us with red fire. They had one burning barrel <laughs> with red that we could see. <laughs> I can remember Hammergan. He was the lead in going in, and I was off to the left of him. And one, and I think it was Burnett was off to my right. And the small arm fire that was coming up and hitting, hey, if you ever seen tracers come up at you and hitting cans and going through cans, why it didn't explode is beyond me. I don't know. You want to hear lead rattle around in a can, you want to hear that in gasoline. <laughs> it's got quite a rumble to it. <laughs> it happened so darn quick, I can't tell you how far out because we were st starting to drop down altitude. And uh, I thought, hey, the way they were starting to form and come down, and we were going to make blitz landings. Uh -huh. And I sit looking at a field and then seen this uh, smudge pot with a big red smudge pot off my right. I knew we were over our target. And that's when we were getting hell then. We were getting it. Flack as well as small arms. Oh, flack with small arms. You see it come up and lazily go by you. And then the next time we wanted to come up underneath it, boom, it was just like a flash and it was it. But you see some of the tracers lazily coming up off the ground and that. When we went down, I took Hammergan off to my right. He was in the lead way off to my right. And uh, I think Burnett went off to following him in. And I know I picked out a spot in between two shell holes and that's where I shoved it and that's where we rolled to a stop. Well, how high were you when you cut off? About 800 feet. Most of these gliders received very heavy fire on the way in, but all of the 20 glider pilots survived the trip without so much as a scratch. All 11 gliders got right in where we had them. Lucky we did because we, they were surrounded by the Germans. Yeah. And uh, what did you carry? We, when we went in, we all carried, the one glider carried the medical team, doctors and nurses and supplies. The rest of us all carried high octane fuel for the tanks. The tracers were just like squirting a hose at you. So just about the time they get to us, we'd either pull up or go under. So the tow planes and the gliders were exchanging places up and down. And we did all had bullet holes through our gliders, but none of us was serious. And uh, how long did you stay then with the 101st uh, before you went, uh, went back? Having an idea. That night we were bombed, we were artillery all night long, never stopped. And then the next day we watched the next load of gliders come in. And uh, it was horrible because you knew those guys up there were the same guys you had graduated with or knew your friends. And then that after, late that afternoon we got gas to the tanks and late that afternoon Patton's boys came through. And they decided that we, the glider pilots were to get back out for another mission. So they put us in, we had seven trucks loaded with German prisoners. And they put two glider pilots on each truck. And uh, I happened to sit in front with the, with the driver. And so I had the, the weapons with me. Captain Wallace F. Hammergren of the 98th Troop Carrier Squadron said when they arrived near dark about 5 p.m., 
The situation around Bastogne had been so confused, we weren't sure that we were in the right place or that the area was still in friendly hands. In the dusk, it was impossible to tell whether these guys were American or Germans. We kept our fingers on our gun triggers and waited. Soon, an American major asked what I was carrying, and I replied, gasoline. And the other gliders, all gasoline too. Thank God, he said, we're down to our last drop. The next day, December 27th, the 439th Troop Carrier Group supplied 50 gliders without co-pilots and they were loaded with 76 tons of gasoline and artillery shells. We had 155 millimeter shells, fuses and the powder all in one glider. They were overloaded. But it was... They were. you have any idea how, how heavy a load you were carrying? No, but I know it was over, over max let's put it that way max gross because it we couldn't glide it at normal glide speed we had to come in a little hotter on that when we landed the, did you make the lz that you were briefed to make i did yeah i was fortunate i was in the fourth or fifth glider in they just hadn't got the altitude on us and it's uh, a lot of a lot of uh, tracers went by and thumped into the glider but uh, i sit there fat dumb and happy and just looked out around and what going on and i wasn't scared i should have been but i guess i was too stupid or something as a glider pilot we're not the brightest but it <laughs> how high were you at this well they took us in at 750 about 750. let's say cut me off i made a about a 90 maybe a little over a 90 pattern uh, landing in that area where uh, I could see down there where the troops were, but they were they seemed to be pretty well uh, spaced between them put the gliders down in the fields. It's, I never did think of mines. <laughs> they might have had mines out there, but I didn't think about it. Well, as you know, the ice, they had ice and snow there for several days, and uh, the ground was solid. It, uh, and I touched the ground. I must have been doing normal come in about 70, you could with some troops, uh, 70, 75. I must have come in about 80 because it wasn't feeling good slower than that. And uh, so I set it on the ground and I couldn't stop it. It just kept going and sliding. I know usually if you put on brakes on ice, you're gonna gain speed just about. So I figured that, uh, well, I didn't want to hit the perimeter out that way. I wanted to stay in as close as I could to the center. So I guided it. I, put it up on the nose and the skids and slid along and I could guide it with the tail. Still pass, so I hit a fence post that I could see and knocked one gear off. And that slowed it down and there was another fence and fence line, so I just went up there and hit the other gear and it come to a stop pretty quick. And there was a, I, I saw the, I, I remember seeing that gun crew at a gun pit nearly in front of me. They all jumped up and started running, and they said, thought I was going to slide right over them. Well, I probably would have if I hadn't hit the post and stopped. Then when you got on the ground, did they come out and get the shells out of your glider? Yes, they did. They were there before I could get out just about. They said they hadn't fired those artillery pieces for four days. They had fired them with charges only. They had not had any ammunition in them. They had this one guy told me, he says, uh, that we, well, we fired them, we haven't fired any ammunition in them for four days, and that uh, we fired them with the charges. We had a lot of charges just to make them think we had ammunition firing at them, so that was it. What were you carrying? I had howitzer ammunition, small arms ammunition, and a, and a mattress full of covers for the dead, you know. <laughs> Body bags. Yeah, yeah, and that's detonators were tied in the tail. Like, you know, really, you were so busy, as you probably know, you were so busy that we didn't have time to think, and it's a good thing you didn't, you know. I, uh, I lit pretty close to, a, a, well, it was a cemetery, really, where I got in and uh, took out a fence and a couple trees and ended up by a hedgerow. And, that was it, and they unloaded that ammunition in a big hurry. They, they were out. I, you know, I was told they were out. They, what did they do with you then after you uh, got in? Did they take you oh. some special place? No, not really. As I remember, you know, it's a little fuzzy dug, you know. Some of the, really, you get to thinking about it, but all I know, I stayed there, and they, they got the ammo unloaded right away. They, uh, 
we just went and holed up someplace. And then I do remember walking around, and I, you remember seeing the general over by his board, uh, where he was conducting what was going on. Like yep, I did remember seeing him momentarily. But then I think we, you know, I remember. I can remember the second day when, when they broke through and we got out of there. All I do, I, I remember, you know, I don't remember what squadron come behind us, but boy, they shot the, you know, they were, uh, they shot them out like shooting pheasants, you know. It was bad news. Tow ships were burning and gliders were coming down. Uh, we were lucky. The 91st was lucky. And what did you carry? Uh, 105. Ammunition? Yeah, oh yeah, nothing but 105 was loaded, stacked and everything, and uh, those are pretty big shells, as you know, and uh, uh, it was, I don't know how many, how many shells they had in there. I know, I remember one thing, they brought the detonators to us and put them, tied them in a little sack right by, so you could reach over and throw them out, I guess, you got them. Didn't want those to get hit. No, I, I get hit, uh, but they put them so close to you. One thing about it, you'd have never known. And, you know, we flew up at a moderate altitude until we got up there, and then they let down on, right on the ground. About where go, were you in the serial? I was number 13. Oh, you were? Oh, it's, it, that, that's probably the most interesting story. The reason everybody wants to hear my story is because I was 13th. We were the 13th plane out of our group, and our group was the first one in. And the Germans did not have time out, the first 12 planes got in pretty good. And by the time they got to 13, they had everything zeroed in on us. And most of the uh, shoot downs were behind us. However, our tow plane, my tow plane got on fire and um, all, the, uh, all the crew had to bail out before, I, before they ever released me. The pilot, I don't know whether you remember this story or not, Joe Fry, was the pilot of the tow plane, and he put it on an automatic pilot and had all of his crew to bail out after the plane got on fire. Well, I hung on, got up high enough to, and kept watching the, the guy, the crew bail out. And then at the very end, uh, Joe tried to get out, and the plane was so much on fire, he had to go out the top escape hatch, had a little escape hatch. Well, Joe was a pretty big guy anyway. And he nearly got caught coming out the escape hatch. But anyway, he pulled his chute, the chute opened and fell across the tail of the airplane. And then when the plane blew, I released before this happened. And, and uh, he made sure I was over the DZ and then uh, I released. And then uh, the plane blew up about that time and uh, blew Joe off the tail section. And it, luckily the, the chute opened. Well, it opened, had opened, but it had fallen across the tail. So that's really what saved his life, is the plane blowing up, because we were so close to the ground. You know, you had to have a little bit of altitude to get your chute open. Did you make the uh, LZ that you were breathing? Exactly. I mean, Joe, of course, we were the 13th plane in, and Joe, we were behind the other plane, and we, we hit, we had a, uh, the airborne jeeps were out there uh, with trailers waiting for the ammunition. I mean, it wasn't two minutes or five minutes till they probably had the ammunition at the guns. That's how well organized they were on the ground to pick us up. On this bitterly cold day, no fewer than 17 C-47s were shot down, plus another 14 were so extensively damaged they were grounded indefinitely for repairs. The 15 gliders that were shot down in enemy territory had their glider pilots officially listed as missing in action. It seems to me that uh, we were getting a lot of uh, enemy fire, oh, probably from 20 minutes out. And I can see those soldiers down there yet aiming their uh, handguns at us and firing. It was uh, awful as far as I was concerned. Lots of snow and very cold. I remember I wore my um, flak jacket, flak vest for uh, several days. It wore a big gaping gash in my neck, but I didn't want to get rid of it. <laughs> my security blanket, I guess it was. 
Well, I was carrying 155 uh, ammunition, high explosive, and they had the detonators wired back to the battery box, or the fuses. And the uh, ammunition was, uh, had uh, lugs in them and they were all uh, cabled and uh, tied down to the floor. And they were laying all over the floor. Were they, uh, were they tied down well enough they didn't move around? While yes. You uh, they didn't shift very much, but uh, I could hear the small ammunition hitting them <laughs> on the way in. <laughs> well, when we uh, got up and uh, they turned, uh, they uh, turned and started in, made the final run into Bastogne, uh, I looked up ahead and uh, to me, it just looked like a big cumulonimbus cloud starting on the ground and it went just as high as way up above the formation. And the tow ships, and all the gliders uh, just kept flying right on into it. And, and uh, um, for we could see uh, some of the tow ships going down and I saw some of the gliders blow up. And uh, uh, I don't know how many because I was pretty busy trying to hold on to the, the, uh, the glider and keep it uh, stable. About where were you in the uh, in that 50 glider series? I was number 35 in the lineup, and uh, by the time they got to us, uh, they were getting pretty accurate with their flak guns. And did they uh, did you take uh, on quite a lot of uh, damage then? Uh, yes. Um, as a matter of fact, I was watching the tow ship, and uh, I could see them uh, shooting at the tow ship with a flak gun, and I very distinctly remember I was said a little prayer hoping that they weren't going to hit that tow ship because uh, otherwise hit that tow ship I was going down too and uh, they uh, they finally did hit it they hit the left elevator and blew a big hole in it and then uh, they quit finally quit tracking the tow ship and they just left the gun firing and uh, they kept firing and coming closer and I kept I seen them I was afraid they were going to hit the tow line so I moved the ladder to the right just as far as I could get it and uh, one burst hit out in the middle of the in front of the glider and the next one hit between the doors which was between the fuses and the ammunition and the last one blew off part of the elevator but uh, outside of that they didn't uh, uh, that was the only damage we sustained I got a few pieces of fragment through the uh, plexiglass but uh, didn't get any in me at all that I know of. Um, one minute out to give you a white light. And when you're over the LZ, well, you're supposed to get the green light. And if you don't cut off, they give, uh, they give you a red light, which tells you in one minute they're going to cut you off. And uh, I had looked at that uh, map pretty, pretty good, and I pretty well read it. And I looked up there, and I didn't see Bastogne at all when I got the white light. And I kept hoping it'd show up pretty soon. And when I got the green light, we still weren't there. And pretty soon they gave me the red light. So I started counting. And when I got up to about 40, I had pulled the tow release. And by the time I pulled it, they pulled theirs too. And that thing was just like a big rubber band coming together in front of us. And uh, I left, leveled her out, stretched my glide as best I could. And I landed about uh, 150 yards, 100, 250 yards inside the compound. When I seen it, there uh, was snow down there. I leveled it out and tried to keep keep the wheels up because I was afraid they'd break through the crust and uh, flip me. And uh, so I had it pretty slow by the time I hit. But I still plowed up a lot of snow. And uh, the airborne came out there and. Uh, started unloading it, and they were a little bit unhappy because I buried that nose in the snowbank somewhere. Uh, we'd been on tow for a long time, and you know, there was no give to those struts, and it beats you around pretty bad. And I know just before we turned and started that run in, I had to go to the bathroom terribly bad, and I was sitting there trying to figure out how I was going to do it. And about that time, we turned and made that run, and uh, I was in the morning sometime, and it was about five o'clock that evening for when I remembered I still hadn't gone to the bathroom. So I guess it was, the ammunition and the flak that we took might have been the most impressive thing about it. 
strung out in a single column, nose to tail, flying at slow speed and low altitude, the tow planes and gliders were easy targets for the German gunners. My glider was loaded with a full load of 155 millimeter shells and four surgeons, uh, which made me a little overweight, but uh, not seriously. But uh, we took off on the flight and it was completely uneventful, a few clouds here and there, but nothing until we got within about 10 miles of the drop zone. And boy, I looked over at my tow airplane and the smoke and fire is coming everywhere. And then the, the, that was his first engine. Then number two followed 30 seconds later. It, it went out too. Ernie was trying his best to try to keep on going, but he, he wasn't towing me anywhere, so he cut off. He cut you off? Yes. That was after he was in complete flames. and They landed, uh, I understand, in the drop zone somewhere. But uh, all I could do was go straight ahead and hope I would make it. And I did, barely. I got just across the line and after a while some airborne troops came along and Colonel Hollis took one look inside the glider and he said, get that damn thing out of here. Going in, I don't remember really even seeing Bass Stone going in, but going in, uh, I was being towed to the C-47 and I remember the Astrodome blowing off the aircraft and then the tail, most of the rudder went and then he started going down and people were jumping out of the aircraft so I cut loose and then went to the ground. I was under a crossfire all the way down. It sounds like somebody's back there playing a tune on all those bars and so forth in the back of the glider. And uh, I did get hit right behind the seat and for some reason or other, I don't know why the powder charges didn't blow up, but uh, it blew about a three foot hole right behind my seat and I landed all right and there was several other gliders in the area that had landed and I started to turn around and get out of the glider. Of course they still had you under crossfire on the ground then and I fell through the hole of the glider and finally I got out of the glider and started crawling like heck and I did get away from it when I started laying mortar fire down and did blow up the glider but I got far enough away from it to be safe. So. And uh, they captured me right there in the field and I, I don't know if anybody else got other, other gliders or not but there must have been four or five gliders in there and I know some German half-tracks shot up a lot of the gliders so whether they didn't intend to take them prisoner or what but you didn't see any other gliders? I didn't see any prisoners? glider pilots at that time no. The 439th group had gone into Bastogne in squadron order with the 91st squadron leading then the 92nd the 93rd and the 94th bringing up the rear of the 50 glider serials that flew desperately needed artillery ammunition into Bastogne on December 27th, the first 29 arrived successfully. Of the remaining 21, 17 were lost with the capture of 13 glider pilots. However, one of those escaped. Three were killed in action, and one of those shot down evaded capture. On December 28th, the glider pilots were sent out of Bastogne as armed guards for the 700 German prisoners that were being sent to the rear. As Fred McKenzie, in his book, The Men of Bastogne, says of the glider pilots as they were getting ready to escort the German prisoners out of Bastogne, the glider pilots were bright-eyed, high-spirited, infected with that strange excitement that characterized the airmen's behavior on returning to base from a hazardous mission. The following are the extremely brave glider pilots who flew into Bastogne in 1944.
the German high command lost its strategic reserve of 220,000 men, half of which were killed or wounded. The Allies lost 84,000, 19,000 killed, and 15,000 captured. The war ended the following May.